chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 17 this morning. The title to our message is The New Temple of God. And as we're turning there, just remember this one truth, loved ones, that of all the words that have ever been spoken, these words that you're about to hear have been breathed out by God himself. So let's hear as God is speaking to us this morning, starting in verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that as Paul said in this text that as an apostle, he has already laid the foundation. He's given us, along with the other apostles, the New Testament authoritative doctrine from you that we have this knowledge of the gospel. And then he has gone on to say that others are going to build on that afterwards. And we thank you for the 2,000 years of teachers and pastors and preachers that have given us more knowledge in your Son. We pray, God, that this morning that you, through this weak vessel, would empower us by your Holy Spirit to be built up. God, we are your temple. Build, Lord, this morning with gold and silver and precious stones. We rely fully and entirely and wholly on you. We ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, please be seated. As we've been working our way through 1 Corinthians, I'm struck again and again how heavenly God's word is. Let's consider a couple of things that we've already heard. Chapter 1, verse 18 Paul says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Or those heavenly words in chapter 2, verse 9, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. God's words are the most precious words in the universe. We get to see that week by week. But what continues to shock me as we are going through 1 Corinthians is God's method. Here you have the Corinthian church. This church is so fleshly, so immature, so full of sin that if a church like this existed in Boise, we, naturally speaking, would want nothing to do with them. They were arrogant. They were sexually immoral. They lacked church discipline. They engaged in lawsuits with one another. 
idolatry, they had heresy in their ranks. But how does God, through the Apostle Paul, handle this church? What's his method of dealing with a wayward people? In the ancient classic, the Odyssey, the main character, Odysseus, has to sail past the deadly sirens. The sirens in Homer's tale were those murderous mermaids who would use their intoxicating singing to lure sailors to their death. And Odysseus knew the danger. So he had a method. He instructed his sailors to tie him to the mast. And then he had his sailors put beeswax in their ears so that when they sailed past the sirens, they were instructed not to loose him no matter how much he begged, no matter how much he cried, and they couldn't hear the singing. Now that worked. That's one way to deal with fleshly problems. Tie yourself to the mast. Subdue it by force. Now, Paul does operate with the Corinthians on that level at some point. In 1 Corinthians 5, he deals with excommunication, and there is going to be a, a kind of a physical restraint of sorts. However, there's a second way to deal with the dangers of the flesh. In another tale, the Argonautica, the Argonauts also have to sail past those deadly sirens, but they use a different method altogether. They bring on board with them the legendary musician and poet Orpheus. Now Orpheus takes his lyre and he begins to play and his song is more breathtaking, more beautiful than that of the sirens. And so the sirens become mere background noise. Nobody needs to be tied up. Nobody needs beeswax in their ears because Orpheus has enchanted their hearts. Captivated by the sweeter song of Orpheus, the Argonauts passed safely by the sirens. Now, God's method here in the Corinthians, at least here in chapter 3, is not to tie them up like Odysseus. Instead, God sings a sweeter song. Last week, after he addressed their fleshliness, he sang of his sovereignty and how ministers are, are mere busboys and farm laborers because it's God who gives the growth. This week, he continues to sing about the foundation that he has laid for us in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sings of the revolutionary change that has taken place in the New Testament church, that we are now the new temple of God, that God's own spirit dwells within us. So loved ones, do you hear the song this morning? That's why God invites us and commands us to come to his house each week on the Lord's day. He knows the struggles that you have in your flesh. He knows that you're just like the Corinthians. You're just like Odysseus, that you are lured away regularly by the sirens of this world. And he wants to sing a sweeter song to us in his word this morning. He's going to sing about what Christ has accomplished for you personally through his death, burial, and resurrection. And his song is better than anything that the sirens of the world have to offer. So let's look at our big idea. It's simply this, that the church is the new temple of God, God's own dwelling place. This is better than anything that the world can ever offer you. We're going to see three things in these verses. First of all, we're going to look at the foundation of the temple of God. Secondly, we're going to see the builders of the temple of God. And then thirdly, we're going to see the people of the temple of God. So let's look firstly at the foundation of the temple of God. Now, last time we were together, Paul finished in verse 9 by saying that we, that is Paul and his fellow co-laborers, are God's fellow workers. And then he says, you are the field, you are God's building. So in verses 5 through 8, 
the metaphor that Paul uses is that of a garden. We are God's own garden or God's own field as he puts it. But now in verses 10 through 17, he switches to the metaphor of a building, but not just any building, a temple, the very temple of God. So in the garden metaphor, Paul's point was that God is the one who causes the garden to grow. Here in the temple metaphor, Paul's point is that since God owns the building, it is he who will inspect his builders and reward according to how he sees fit. Remember, remember the problem here in the Corinthian church. The Corinthians were choosing sides and were dividing up into parties. So the way that the Corinthians viewed Paul at best was that he was just a leader of one particular party. But at worst, those who were against Paul, they dismissed him of someone of no consequence. In other words, the Corinthians were judging Paul and the other ministers according to worldly standards. Paul insinuates as much. In chapter 4, verse 3, he says, But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. So his purpose in this section is to show why this is wrong, this judging. None of us have the ability to rightly judge those who God is truly called to minister in his church. We saw this example last week of Jeremiah versus Jonah. If we were to judge those ministers according to the wisdom of the world, according to what we see with our own eyes, Jonah would be our man. We would make him the leader of our party. But he was a reluctant prophet. Read it again. He didn't even want the Ninevites to be saved. He was not a good pastor. But Jeremiah, on the other hand, he labored long and suffered much and had zero success according to worldly standards, and yet he had God's approval. So Paul's point here is that only God can rightly judge each of his leaders' contribution to his church. Much of the building, as Paul calls it, that they do will be invisible to us until the day of judgment. So to divide up into factions is absurd because it implies that you can judge and know what only God can judge and know. And so what this means for verses 10 through 15 is that Paul is mainly talking about ministers. That is, church leaders. It doesn't mean that there's not an application for the rest of us Christians, but that's not his main point. So let's keep that in mind. Let's begin with verse 10. Paul says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. I think it's amazing that in all of Paul's divinely inspired writings, he never seeks to steal a single particle of glory from God. He's saying the foundation that I laid comes from God. Though I am a master builder, All of that building came from God. This was his method. Colossians 1, 29, he says there, Christ we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this, this purpose, I toil, struggling with all of his energy that he powerfully works in me. So it wasn't only that God's grace called Paul to be an apostle. It was also through God's grace that he worked and labored as an apostle. The Greek word for master builder here in verse 10 is where we get the word architect. As human agents, the apostles of the church surpass all other ministers in terms of their calling. Because their doctrine, the apostles' doctrine, serves as the entire blueprint for the church. For 2,000 years, Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles. So through Paul's apostolic teaching, that's what he means when he says, I laid a foundation. We have the whole doctrine that the church rests on. 
Just as a house rests on a foundation, the church has rested on these doctrines of the apostles for 2,000 years. Continuing in verse 10. And someone else is building upon it. Let each one take careful, take care how he builds upon it. Others have come after Paul and built on the foundation that he laid. And this is how, how we know that he has ministers in mind. Just like Paul laid the foundation in his preaching and teaching, so others build on that same foundation through their preaching and teaching. So in Ephesus, Paul left Timothy to build on his foundation, 1 Timothy 1.3. In Corinth, Apollos came after him and built on the foundation, Acts 18, 24, and 28. And here's the only command that he gives in this passage. He says, let each one take care how he builds. Be careful how you build, he tells all ministers throughout the ages. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that pastors are never allowed to preach however they want to preach. We are never allowed to erect buildings separate from the foundation that the apostles have laid. That's treason. And this is especially a temptation in America with its entrepreneurial spirit. Pastors are tempted to, to build their own empire, whether it's a big church or a small church. The celebrity pastor phenomenon is the siren song that lures pastors away. But secondly, what this means when Paul says, let each of one you take care of how he builds, he means that our building must correspond with the foundation, meaning our teaching and preaching must match his. All preachers and teachers, if they're going to be faithful, must conform their teaching to the apostles, to the New Testament. Why? Verse 11. Why? Because, or for, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. This verse represents the fundamental truth of the entire Bible. It's at the very bottom. It's the foundation of everything else. No other foundation will lead to life. Acts 4.12 says, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven by which a man must be saved. Now, many evangelicals can hear what I just said and say, amen to all of that. Because we all generally acknowledge, I hope if you're a Christian, that Christ is the beginning of our salvation. And just like a foundation is the beginning of a building. However, many of those same evangelicals believe that once that foundation of Christ is laid, then in order to build the rest of the structure, we need to move on to bigger and better things. In other words, Jesus is what we need for initial salvation. He's the minimum truth required to be saved. He's, he's the admissions test. He's the entry point. But then it's understood that as we make progress in the Christian life through we make progress in the Christian life through the application of more advanced stuff. Jesus is presumed. In other words, Jesus is the answer for your salvation. He's the foundation. But he's not the, uh, he's not the answer for all the other problems that you face. You have to build other things. Now, is that what Paul means here? Not at all. He's already laid the, the principle down in chapter 2, verse 2, that Christ is what we need at the beginning and the middle and the end. For I decided to know nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified. He, he says, I don't know anything else except for Christ. Meaning Christ is the foundation that we build upon in the beginning and he is what we build with as we continue in our life. Consider just three examples how Jesus is the answer for all the diverse problems in this congregation. So think about this. To those of you, and maybe 
This is to you, especially to those of you at home right now. To those of you who are suffering physically, who are close to death. Don't you know that God has already given you the victory through Jesus Christ? That's what 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says. The Bible tells you that because Christ is your Savior, death has already been conquered for you. In fact, as Christians, we can say that death is God's last gift to us on this planet because at that point, we'll be finally delivered from the sting of curse Sting and curse of sin, and we will be brought into perfect communion with Jesus. That's what Jesus accomplished for you, loved ones. To those of you, let's address a separate problem. To those of you whose marriages are falling apart or whose families are falling apart, don't you realize that your true love and your true family is in heaven? And that is something that can never be torn apart from you ever. Even though Jesus was in God's family, he was God's own son. Jesus was cast out and he was lost so that you could be brought into God's family. You have the approval of a father and the love of a father that will never put you out of his family. Don't you see that that doesn't necessarily take care of your immediate problem of your family But it it frees you from anxiety and worry and concern. And it it allows you to love those people without needing their approval because you are already approved by Christ. Or thirdly, in our last example, to those of you who are currently caught right now in some sin, some secret sin, some bosom sin. It, it's like a snare that's wrapped around your leg and it's starting to crawl up and you can't get out. You don't know what to do. And you feel like you've out God's grace and there's no way back. Don't you know, beloved, that Jesus is the good shepherd and he leaves the 99 and he comes after the one that's gone astray? Don't you know that just as a father pities a child who is sick, Jesus pities you when you're especially caught in sin. That doesn't mean that he loves the sin. Of course, he hates the sin, but he doesn't hate you. He has pity on you. The bowels of his heart are drawn out to you. That's why the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Your Savior is especially glorified in taking wandering, lost, dirty sheep like you and bringing them back into the fold. He loves to do that. He's the hound of heaven and he will hunt you down with steadfast love and faithfulness. So don't you see, loved ones, Christ is the solution for everything that we face. We don't merely preach Christ as the foundation. We build our lives off of him. So that's our first point. The foundation of the temple of God And everything that follows is Christ. So let's look at the builders, our second heading, the builders of the temple of God. Let's look at verse 12. Paul says, now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Now, Paul is very Jewish here because he's alluding to the building of Solomon's temple. Before David died, David started gathering materials for Solomon. We read this in 1 Chronicles 29.2. So I, David says, have provided for the house of my God, the temple of the, the Lord. So far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, the wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for setting, 
antimony, colored stones, and all sorts of precious stones and marble. So Paul is lifting that and he's bringing it into the New Testament now. And so what are these building materials? What do they represent? Well, it's clear from the rest of our passage that the gold, silver, and precious stones are the right building materials, while the wood, hay, and straw are the wrong ones. How are we to think about this? Well, remember our context. Paul is not speaking about believers in general here, but only church leaders that that are doing the building. They're the ones that the Corinthians were lining up behind with party spirits. So then how are church leaders to build? How do they build? How do pastors and preachers and teachers build the church? Through preaching and teaching. That's how the church is primarily built up. Paul told the Ephesian elders in his last visit to them in Acts 20, 32, he says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. So elders and pastors and church leaders build up the church through the teaching and preaching of the word. And so these... And they answer to that foundation, while the wood, hay, and straw are those doctrines that don't answer to Christ at all. So to borrow from what Paul has already said in chapters 1 through 2, the gold and silver and precious stones are those doctrines which are based on the wisdom of God. And that wood, hay, and straw are those that are based on the wisdom of man. Now it is important to point out here that, that even these doctrines made from wood, hay, and straw, they're not soul-destroying doctrines. They're just worthless doctrines. The great Scottish pastor, Robert Layton, who ministered in the 17th century in Glasgow. At one point, he was called to a public gathering of pastors, a synod. And he was rebuked in front of all of them because they said that his preaching wasn't relevant to the culture. They said that he was not preaching up the times. So Leighton responded by saying, who does preach up the times? And they responded, well, all the brethren do. So said he in response, if all of you preach up the times, you may surely allow one poor brother to preach up Christ Jesus and eternity. Leighton was right, wasn't he? Now, don't get me wrong, obviously it's right to preach Christ and Him crucified in a way where it addresses culture, and we should do that. But often what we see in the name of relevance is that the pulpit becomes untethered from the gospel, and it begins to adopt the world's categories. I think it's so tragic today that we see many who are associated with the Gospel Coalition, for example, adopt categories of Black Lives Matter and this idea of being woke. Those are the things, those things belong to the worldly wisdom of our day, just like the Greek philosophical categories belong to the worldly wisdom in the Corinthian church. The only difference is 2,000 years. It's not an accident that the more these things are taught and preached on in the church, the more the church becomes divided. Because whenever the doctrine of Christ is buried As the foundation under this mass of strange doctrines, the church begins to divide into factions, just like in Corinth. Now, Paul's larger point here is that this worldly wisdom in wood and hay and straw is not always apparent to us. I think that's fairly obvious from experience. We hear different voices today who we consider faithful men saying opposite things, and it's not immediately apparent to us which one's right and which one's wrong. 
Notice what he says in verse 13. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. He says, on that day it will be manifest. The day, capital D, will disclose it. It will make known what, whether a minister's teaching is gold or straw. Now, the day here is obvious. It's the day of the Lord. It's the the day of judgment. And that day will manifest the truth or falsehood of every doctrine that's ever been taught. So here we arrive at our first principle. That's right. Pay attention. First principle. Every doctrine that our church leaders teach us are awaiting God's final judgment on that great day. One more time. Every doctrine that our church leaders teach us is awaiting God's judgment on that final day. Consider that, loved ones. Oh, the weight of what we do. God is the one who will inspect our work. No wonder why Paul said, who is sufficient for these things? Our Lord Jesus Christ will examine the way very carefully the way that each minister has taught to see if those things that he taught are worthy of him or no. How serious he must be about his gospel. Are we that serious about it? Do we listen with care and with diligence and with a willingness to conform our lives to these things? Do we open our hearts to these things? Or has the preaching become like a dead formalism where we we come here and we listen because that's what Christians are supposed to do? Loved ones, God is the most careful listener to his preached word. Are we carefully listening alongside of him? Let's look at verses 14 and 15. He continues, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, it's clear that Paul is not talking about the judgment we see like in Matthew 25 where he's separating the sheep from the goats, where he's welcoming the first group into heaven and he's casting the rest into hell. Now, this judgment here is strictly for believers. And so the issue is not reward or punishment. It's not heaven or hell. It's reward or no reward. And that's clear from verse 15. If anyone's work is burned up, he's going to suffer loss, but he's not going to lose his salvation. This imagery is so vivid. Imagine a man who builds a house out of wood and hay and straw. It's it's the materials for a hut. And a great fire ravages through his village and it burns up everything in his house and he loses his house itself, but he is able to escape, as it were, through the flames. He loses everything, but he saves, but his own life is spared. So apply this to those who preach and teach. One either builds the the church through the preaching of the cross and through instruction in sound doctrine, which leads to reward, or else one attempts to build the church through the wisdom of men, which inevitably leads to factions and division. So how is Paul specifically applying this to the rest of the church? Well, sometimes it's true that divisions can come because church leaders themselves are operating on worldly wisdom, but that's not actually the case in Corinth. Paul and Apollos were not creating divisions. It was the church that was doing it. They they were judging their pastors like Simon Cowell on American Idol. They were judging them based on personality and style and not substance. And so that brings us to our second principle. 
we ought never to judge the work of our leaders that God has given us. We ought never to judge the work of our leaders that God has given us. Let me qualify. Yes, we know that there are false teachers and Jesus says we shall know them by their fruits, Matthew 7, 20, and we should avoid them. And yes, we should always be good Bereans and test what we are being taught against the scriptures, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. That aside, we simply do not have the ability to judge the value of our leaders in the whole scheme of things. Paul has made it clear. It's only on this day when the fire will reveal the true nature of their building products, whether their work was gold or straw. And what that means is this, is that it is equally as wrong to elevate our leaders to a a position that they shouldn't be elevated to or to degrade our leaders. Either one of those positions Paul is condemning here. He's going to say it clearly in the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in the darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Any deviation from that rule just will create factions in the church. God didn't give us leaders so that we could sit back and criticize them or idolize them. He gave us leaders so that they would build us up in the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a gift. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I got to say that other pastors at this church and the other deacons at this church, they are one of God's greatest gifts to my life. They pastor me. They love me. They admonish me. They exhort me. They encourage me. And how that would be lost if I tended to criticize them as God's leaders or idolize them. That was what was happening in the Corinth church. Before we move on to the last section, I want to answer one critical objection. And it goes like this. If Christ's aim is to stop all human boasting so that we can glory in him alone, then what will prevent us from boasting in heaven when some will have more rewards than others? Because that's what the text says. Some will lose the rewards and some will gain rewards. If some have less and some have more, won't that create envy from those who have less and arrogance from those who have more? And of course, the easy answer is no, because since we're going to be glorified in heaven, um, all that sin will be put away. But I actually believe there's actually a better answer. And it has to do with Christ. What is this reward that Paul speaks about? The, re- the reward is simply this a greater conformity to Christ, a greater capacity of holiness, a greater capacity of love, a greater likeness to Jesus himself. Don't you see? The reason why those with lesser reward in heaven will not envy those with greater reward is because they will see them and they will look more like Jesus. They will see more of his perfections and more of his excellencies and more of his glory in them. And this will cause them to have not less love for them, but it will cause them to love them even more. I mean, isn't this why your hearts melt when, when we see with our spiritual eyes the personality of the Apostle Paul in the pages of scriptures? His, his own person helps us to see Christ better. His greater conformity to Christ doesn't make us envy him in a sinful way. It draws out our heartstrings of love to him. So the more that we see of Christ in Paul, the more that we are compelled to love him. And this love towards Paul will only increase in heaven when we no longer have sin to deal with. But on the other hand, those who have greater reward in heaven will not be arrogant to those who have lesser reward because precisely Precisely because they are more like Christ. They are more humble. They are more holy. 
Jesus is infinitely meek and infinitely holy. And that doesn't make us love him less. It makes him love us all the more. Likewise, the saints who have a greater reward in heaven won't disdain or judge those who are beneath them. They will love them like Jesus loves them. Now, you may say to me, but I thought we were all going to be conformed to Christ on that day. 1 John 3, 2 says, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. So how can you say that some will have a greater conformity to Christ? Well, because, loved ones, Christ is infinite and we are finite, which means that we can have different capacities of conformity. Think of it this way. Imagine you have two cups. Both of them are completely full of liquid. In this sense, all of God's people will be perfectly full of Christ in heaven and full of love towards the saints. Yet, one cup is bigger than the other. They have a capacity for more liquid. Those people who have a, a bigger cup have a greater capacity for Christ. Listen to how Jonathan Edwards says it. He says, it will not be a grief to any of the saints in heaven to see those that are higher than themselves in holiness and likeness to God. For all shall have as much of love as they desire and as great manifestations of love as they can bear. And so all shall be fully satisfied and where there is perfect satisfaction, there can be no envy. Don't you see how Christ is all? I, I mean, if we get to heaven... And the reward is just more stuff? Is that the way that God designed us? Isn't the spiritual part of our nature the superior part? That's not to say that there won't be stuff in heaven. There, are, there is. The new heavens and the new earth are just as physical as these heavens and this earth. But the way that God rewards us is with more of him, more of Christ. So he's the foundation of the temple, Christ is the building materials for the temple, and he's the reward for the builders of the temple. So let's look at our last point. The people of the temple of God. Now here's where we see God's stunning method so clearly. Like the Corinthians, we are often so fleshly, so divisive. We are often turning our ship and sailing towards the sirens as fast as we can. But instead of Jesus tying us to the mast like we deserve, he sings a sweeter song. Please look with me at verse 16. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? The you here in the Greek is plural. Uh, Paul is no longer just speaking about the church's leaders. He's speaking to you about the whole church, that we are the temple of God. And now it's clear that he's been talking about a temple all along, though this is the first time he uses the word. This building that ministers have been building up is you. You are God's great construction project throughout all of redemptive history. And in terms of redemptive history, this is one of the most shocking things that Paul has said in this letter so far. What do we know about the temple or the tabernacle in the Old Testament? Well, when the first tabernacle was completed, we read this in Exodus 40, 34 and 35. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the most significant place on planet earth because it was the place where the living God met his people. It's where God met man. We'll fast forward to the time when Solomon finished the temple proper in Jerusalem, which took seven years. At its dedication, we read this in 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 2. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer at the dedication, 
fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. In both the tabernacle and the temple, the glory of the Lord was so overwhelming that no man could enter. Fast forward to the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We read in John 1.14 that he became flesh and dwelt among us. The word is tabernacled among us. Jesus became the new temple of God. Instead of God's spirit filling a, a temple made of stone, God's spirit now filled the Son of God. And God the Father gave Jesus the Holy Spirit without measure, John 3.34 says. And now the glory of the Lord is seen by all people in the person of Jesus. John says this, that we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now that seems like that's the end of this idea of the temple. But then on the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus said something very perplexing. He said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Why would Jesus say that? How can the departure of Jesus be to our advantage at least for a time? Because we are the new temple on earth. The church and every individual believer now have this unspeakable privilege of being that place where God dwells on earth. Do you realize how shocking this would have been for the Jews in Corinth to hear this news? This, this letter was written in the mid-50s, which means the temple that Herod built was still standing in Jerusalem because it wasn't destroyed until AD 70 by Titus. But Paul is saying here, it's not that temple where God dwells on earth. He's saying that the final act of redemptive history is not the rebirth of the temple in Jerusalem. It's not the building up of a physical temple where God can dwell. The final act of it in redemptive history is God taking sinners like these Corinthians, like us, and making his home in us. Will God dwell with man on earth? Yes, that's what the church is, beloved. It's the very identity of the church. We're going to sing a song. Yet she on earth has union with God, the three in one. We see how jealous God is of this temple in our final verse. Please look at verse 17. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Now, clearly God is talking about unbelievers here. The teachers in verse 15 who teach worthless doctrine, they will have their reward burnt up, but they still hold on to the foundation. They're not destroyed. They're saved. But here in verse 17, Paul is talking the way that Peter talked. In 2 Peter 2, verse 1, there are a kind of teachers in the church. They're teaching heresy that will be destroyed. Peter says this, false prophets also arose among you, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. If in the Old Testament, God didn't allow his temple to be defiled with impunity, which he didn't because God struck people down who entered into the Holy of Holies by his own power. If he did that in the Old Testament, then how much more so will he not allow his New Testament temple, the people of God, to be defiled ultimately? Why? Why? End of verse 17, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. What a frightful warning to the world today. Nations of the world, be warned that God will destroy you if you attempt 
to destroy his church. But there is an application for the Corinthians and for us. These divisions and this party spirit that existed in Corinth, they just were either accidentally or purposefully an attempt to destroy the church. Paul is essentially saying this. If that is the end for unbelievers, that, it, that they will be destroyed if they try to destroy the temple, how then should we live? How can we possibly do the same things that they do? And so the end of verse 17 could, could be kind of put into a spiritual syllogism. The temple of God is holy. That's premise number one. Premise number two, you are the temple of God. Conclusion, therefore, you are holy. He doesn't say, therefore, be holy. Other scriptures say that. But he says, you are holy. You already are set apart from the world. You are already the temple of God. You have already been drugged out of those pagan temples. You already belong to God. And so, this is the logic of Paul's ethic. He's saying, loved ones, become what you already are. Don't you know this about yourself? You already are God's temple. You already, you already are holy. So be who you are. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to us this morning. You don't need to return to the world. The sirens have nothing to offer you. I've already been singing to you a sweeter song. You don't have to earn my love. That, that's the reason why we do party spirits. That's the reason why we have divisions. Because we want, like we said last week, we want to have worth. We want to have approval. But Jesus is saying, you already have my approval. I've shed my blood for your sins. I fulfilled God's law with my perfect obedience. I rose from the dead so that you would rise also. And nothing can ever change that. You don't need to prove anything. You don't need to be anybody because you already are the temple of God. I already know your failures. I already see your sins and you're still mine. You don't need the approval of others. You are mine. You were already holy. You were already loved and accepted. Be who you are. Isn't that a sweeter song? Perhaps you're here this morning and you know that this is not true about you. The Spirit of God does not dwell in you. Jesus Christ is not the foundation of your life. Do you realize that the greatest commandment for every human being is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength? But you, dear friend, have never put God first. You have the spirit of the world in you, the spirit of selfishness, because you live for no one but yourself. And dear friend, the scripture says that you are like the fool who built his house, not on the foundation, but on sand. And when a great storm arose and beat against the house, the house fell down and was ruined. That storm is coming for you. It's the wrath of God against your sin for not honoring and loving him. And there's no escape on your own. No amount of good deeds can ever wipe away your guilt. You need innocent blood. You need to be made right. That's what Jesus offers sinners like you and me what, with what he did on the cross. He can wash you in his own blood. He can make you as white as snow. How? By simply trusting him to be your savior. If you come to Jesus by faith, faith means that you simply hold your hands out empty as it were and you receive him and all of his promises. If you do that by faith, you'll be saved. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Spirit of God will take residence up in you, and you will be the new temple of God on earth. I hope you do that today. I hope you think about that. Children, think about that. 
if you have not personally closed with Christ, if you've not personally trusted him as your savior, none of us are exempt from the from that day when we will stand before him. Let's pray. Father, we've